there was more more money was spent on miniatures on Sith than all of making Star Wars. You know, it, it you you can see that with you, you look at Star Wars and there's like five color elements. There's Luke's white costume, the gray background, the gold C-3PO, the the five or four things on the table that he's working on. And then, of course, by the time you reach Sith, sometimes it's like uh, there's you know, 800 spaceships traveling in the background. There's pods doing this. There's, there's stuff everywhere, you know. And, it, and it's, it's, like the, it's like looking at the, the simplest of Pablo, Picasso, Pablo Picasso's paintings on one side and the most uh, close-up of uh, Surratt painting, you know, and it's just dots and it's things and stuff is happening all the time in, in Sith. But there were, you know, the amount of work that was in it was just incredible. There were around 100 model makers for Sith. You know, just Mustafar, the big lava planet, was huge. It was, uh, let's just say it was 25 feet wide by uh, 40 feet long, 50 feet long or something like that. A big tilting floor, all sculpted. It was, I was the head sculptor on that one, and it, we had maybe a dozen sculptors working on it, you know with machetes and knives and, you know, hacking away at the thing. It was a long build, and then also I think they shot on it for like four and a half months. It was one of the longest shoots there ever, ever had been on a model. It was wonderful because I was able to do a little bit of everything, use all my skills of what I can do as an artist, you know, sculpt, paint, creature work, model work. It was one of those things that being able to use all my skills of what I really love to do on a show that inspired me in 77, you know? <laughs> that, was, that was the coolest thing, it's like, you know, and, and when I was able to do it, I can't remember the very first thing I did, but as a makeup uh, artist, when they, when they decided to, to do some reshoots of some scenes, and I, I don't know why, but I, I don't ask why. It's like, okay, fine, we're gonna reshoot this scene, that's great, because, um, so I, I put these, the Bib Fortuna uh, prosthetics on Matthew Wood, who was a sound guy back then on that show, and then for the miniatures, you know, it was like, I mean, you got pod racers, you got the Federation landing ship, you know, that was like these little things that really actually made an impact on, on the show. And not like huge, but I mean, I saw it, you know, it didn't get cut out, and the Federation landing ship really worked out. Um, even a Boss Nass, or what was it, I can't remember, it was like a, a jungle kind of swampy setting that worked on that for a long time. It was a lot of environment building uh, uh, ground planes and, and, and temples and stuff too for that. Actually the head, Mark Siegel sculpted that, but that head was, it was almost like what Congo, we did on Congo, you know, but it didn't fall apart, but they wanted to shoot a plate of this environment that these guys worked in, and, and when they got really close up, they went into the bubble, and then he was, sit, they were all sitting in this little chamber, all these things, that was a sculpture I worked on, that was uh, the, the, the actual seat, the, the, the whole beautiful little seat that almost looked like a, some organic form. His chair, that was all a little miniature sculpture about that big that worked on. And then that was all like, that was the part, and the outside had sculptures uh, outside of the bubble too. That was all, and then there was a miniature whole set with those sculptures that were shot. There was, oh God, there's just so many, but yeah, with, with episode one, it was just a little bit of everything. I mean, it, it was great. I had a blast doing that. And then episode two came along. There was not as much spaceships, but more environments like the hallway for uh, the, the, the alien planet. I can't remember the name of it. But all the hallways and model work on that was beautiful. And that was stuff like that, that's what they did. And did a ground, ground planes for the battle scenes. And for, for me, when I was working on it, because actually on episode two, I was working on signs also. And I was working with the character designer, Carlos Monte doing the alien, and um, some and, and the sculpted the leg. But after that got on hold, because they were redesigning the alien look, before we did even the maquette. I went back on episode two and did some makeup. It was funny because with ILM, I, I became the in-house prosthetic makeup artist to do makeup, which was really unique and, and, and I was fortunate because and they could have brought in some other people. But I mean, on, even on the special edition, they brought in some other people to help us. But I eventually we started being able to get some makeup work and do the makeup too, which was fantastic because I mean, that's what one of my first loves is Revenge of the Sith. Um, and when, when we started working on that, that was actually a really good opportunity for me because I was able to actually go to the ranch at uh, Jack Films Art Department, which was uh, George Lucas's art department for Star Wars, you know, for that. All three of them actually, they had, they had the ranch and called Jack Films. And so we did all the um, artwork and the concept models for 
episode three. And I was hired to do environments and um, try to think of these different characters and try to make these environments come alive and make them have own characters to them. I mean, it was a little bit different. It was kind of nice. I mean, a as a guy who was doing miniatures and creatures and make it whatever, um, I, I did these miniatures of, of these environments, but I really made them come alive and I really put my creativity into it. And it was it was, it was was a great experience because working uh, uh, with the best in the world of, of you know, doing, you know, two-dimensional artwork and, and some of these other sculptors that were there doing some characters that were fantastic. And I ended up doing, you know, the Utapau sinkhole and the close-up of the Utapau sinkhole landing platform and the close-up of the wall itself. And this is all made of clay, all sculpted out of clay. And I mean, they turned out great and they, George really liked them. And one of the nice models that I did was the Wookiee tree. And that was like a, a miniature maquette of, of how the tree looked. So I, I did, I basically took Eric Tiemann's and Ryan Church's two-dimensional designs and made them into three-dimensional concept models how they would look and had George look at them and say, okay, change this, I don't like this, or whatever. And so it, it was neat because most of all my ideas, what I really kind of came up with with the three-dimensional form, really kind of came out so nicely that George looked at him and said, oh, this, this, this part really, really works well. We, we, we could have this part coming, you know, from out light that will look, look really nice with light and stuff. Um, one of the first ones I did, he, he did, who was very honest, he said, well, this, we got to really watch out because this is, this area, it's more bony here and we got to change this, whatever. So um, it was good because I was able to bring that back and change it a little week and a week later. I brought it back in. I go, yeah, yeah, that looks better. That's great. Okay, that's approved. You know, so you work with him going back and forth like that. And to me, I was there, that's what I was there for. You know, it was neat to, to do that and, and being able to sculpt these maquettes for, for episode three, that's fantastic, you know. And then after, the best thing, after all it was all done, I went back to ILM to work on the bigger versions. So that was fantastic, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, I worked on the Utapau sinkholes, and then after that, I was supposed to go on to some, I think, hard edge model making on that, because I did some of the, uh, like the landing platform, and there's kind of bony structures and stuff, I was going to work on that. But they really need somebody to carve, I think it was called the, that's a whole set that was supposed to be all kind of evil and everything. It was one of those uh, uh, carvings that we did that it was right where the, the cyst live, you know, and it was one of those uh, projects that they had only like, you know, three people currently and we need another person. I mean, we worked with uh, Lauren Peterson on that and, he, and I got to work on some of the, the hero areas where the spaceship lands. The whole planet was Mustafar, so it was making Mustafar as a whole lava planet. And that's where they literally had the whole thing in a slant. We carved all Mustafar on that and we put, you know, slime down there and shot lights underneath it. When that was all done, I actually went over to another model because um, they were going to be in darkness for six months. <laughs> Shooting that. And I was like, well, I think I'm going to, I went on the tree, I think the Wookiee tree, because I designed the Wookiee tree with Eric and Jesse. So I was like, oh, I might as well work on the big one. So, you know, so that was almost, that was a paint where they're, I think, a painting and doing some stuff. They're almost done with that. So I kind of worked on that a little bit. There were so many things to do on that show. It was, it was actually neat to be part of the design department and then work on the bigger versions. It was, it was great. And by the time we were into all the Star Wars prequels, we were doing over 2,000 visual effects shots for the films. And, um, you know, it's a little known fact, we actually did more miniatures for the, the, each of those films instead of less. Everyone thinks because computer graphics came in, each Star Wars movie actually built more miniatures than the one before. You know, the big change was in vehicles. We didn't do so many vehicles, but there, were, there was a lot of miniatures work being done on those films. But, you know, uh, CG was certainly rampant during that period of time, and it kept growing and growing and growing. I kind of, in a fun way of thinking of it, I remember in American history is that John Henry the Steel Driving Man with the people who laid the railroad tracks, and there's this big, huge black guy who would pound the nails into the tracks, and he was really fast, and then they'd come up with a steam engine that could do it, and, you know, and of course, John Henry was faster and faster, and it keeps ahead of the machine, but, of course, uh, eventually... He dies, and, and the machine plows right on through. And I thought, yeah, ours is kind of a John Henry steam steel driving man kind of a relationship here, you know, because because CG, as a friend of mine said, you know, he, he I was asking him, he was in computers, and I said, where do you think it's leading to? He wasn't a Lucasfilm employee, but um, he said, well, if it's moving, they'll do it in CG. If it has blur and everything like that, you won't be able to keep up. Uh, with something like that. If it's a, a very uh, stable, you know, non-moving thing, uh, good resolution, uh, you know, models, models may uh, have, a, uh, have a future there. 
and and we did we big set pieces and all that kind of stuff we did zillions of big giant set pieces and things like that to this day and and that's something rick mccallum understood uh george really wanted to be you know uh innovative and do um as much computer technology as possible in, in his films but um you know rick mccallum really understood that you could get a better look and it was less expensive to use miniatures for a lot of different things uh you know you're still hitting a wall even today with the fast computers and and uh you know, the, the better uh, programs and a lot of people writing uh, code specific for effect shots, it's still uh, oftentimes a lot more money to do these large, expansive, uh, complex scenes with computers than it is to do with miniatures. Miniatures, it's, it's, it's interesting. A lot of people go straight to computer graphics these days because it's a shiny red button. First it was the new toy, now it's the shiny red button. And everyone thinks, I've got a computer at home. I push this button and something happens. And so they imagine that that's the case. And um, I've been fortunate in my career to have worked on both computer graphics films and uh, you know, practical effects films. And you still have model makers, they're just doing it in the computer. And then you have uh, a UV person who puts the UVs on so someone can paint it. Then you have your texture people who paint it. Then you have your riggers who rig it for any moving parts. And then you have your animators that have to animate it. And, you know, you still have lighting crews. You still have all the same, you know, departments that you would have on a feature film. It's just they're virtual. And um, because directors and supervisors aren't locked into deciding on what needs to be in that scene, a lot of times the, the, the original bid is lower. But then eventually it just runs away and because of all the changes and not locking in on anything that you get with that computer technology, um, they end up being a lot more expensive than if you had done it practically.